Chapter Twenty Six of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six The Parish Hears the News. In the damp basement room of the Presbyterian Church, used indifferently for Sunday school, prayer meetings, and the more secular activities of the Ladies' Aid Missionary Society, Mrs. Buckthorn, as president of the latter organization, was assisting Miss Electa Pratt chairman of the sewing committee to lay out the work for the afternoon we really ought to get that home missionary barrow ready to go to the mountain whites this week said mrs buckthorn with a deep sigh expressive of the burden which rested upon her ample shoulders i hope we'll have a good attendance to-day miss pratt sniffed as she held up to view a limp and faded muslin dress of a fashion long since decadent the buttons is tore right out of this waist she observed with a malicious smile do you think it would pay to fix and just look at the hem must have been awful muddy and never got washed clean mrs buckthorn compressed her lips i donated that dress myself she said after careful and prayerful consideration some mountain white mother will be glad and thankful for the opportunity of making over that dress for her child no elector we will not take the ladies time to repair it let them go on with the rompers for the missionaries twins then there's the ribbons to cut and sew for the mile of pennies we're beginning for repairs on the church edifice how much did you have to pay a yard for that ribbon elector ten cents replied miss pratt and it ain't all silk she rolled her greenish eyes toward the door oh there comes mrs puffer oh and do look if she ain't bringing her two youngest much work will get accomplished to-day i suppose she remembered it was tea and cake day <laughs> good afternoon mrs puffer oh the dear little tots so glad you brought em right along i had to replied the matron plaintively or oh, stay at home the baby's teething and kind of fretty and the twins can't do nothing with georgie he's so ambitious and high-spirited he takes after his pa georgie does mrs buckthorn gazed over the top of her spectacles at the little boy who stood with his hands judiciously folded behind his fat person staring imperturbably about the sacred precinct little boy she said in a deep hollow tone do you love jesus young master puffer appeared to be considering the question with some doubt when his mother hastily interposed in his behalf oh, of course he does miss buckthorn he says his prayers just as cunning every night and he'd have been in sunday school all summer if he hadn't had whooping cough this spring and gone from that right into the measles and from that into chicken pox there's some children that seem elected to be saved from their earliest infancy stated mrs buckthorn sonorously my oldest girl martha ellen was that kind she died when she was six water on the brain she could repeat correctly twenty-one hymns and a hundred and eight verses from the bible i've often wondered what she'd have growed up to be had she been spared but there's others that seem born for perdition they don't appear to have no real comprehension of spiritual things as i tell the deacon her spectacled glance dwelt darkly on the two small puffers who had taken refuge in their mother's skirts i'd rather my children would live and be healthy murmured mrs puffer rebelliously i'd be scared stiff if they was too religious and like that a number of ladies had strayed in by twos and threes and mrs buckthorn's attention happily diverted from the subject of infant salvation to the more urgent demands of her official position passed them in review one by one i don't see our pastor's wife in the room she observed has any one seen mrs pettibone i requested her to lead the devotional exercises this afternoon and we're already five minutes past the hour no one replied at first and then a thin voice uprose from the back of the room 
I don't think she's come in. You don't think... Mrs. Salter, did I understand you to say that our pastor's wife wasn't coming? The lady addressed, now the target for every eye, moved her angular shoulders slightly. It was evident that she was labouring under strong, though suppressed, excitement. I supposed you'd heard, Miss Buckthorn, she said. But if you ain't... Heard? Heard what? Why, that the minister's wife's got a baby. A gasp of incredulity exhaled sharply from every matron's breast. Miss Electa Pratt achieved a virginal blush, which, unluckily, centred upon the end of her nose. You must be mistaken, said Mrs. Puffer authoritatively. I'm sure I ought to know. Sarah Jane Salter, you are mistaken, declared Mrs. Buckthorn. Do you suppose for a moment that I... It's adopted, conceded Mrs. Salter negligently. I thought I said so. Adopted? The word uprose in vehement chorus, after which every lady looked searchingly at every other lady, and finally at Mrs. Buckthorn. That lady had taken up her Bible, with an air of rigid self-control, the kind and variety of that sterling quality which appears to put off for future consideration a subject too large for unpremeditated speech. "'We will read together the twenty-eighth psalm,' she said in her deepest prayer-meeting voice, "'and afterward be led in prayer by Miss Deaconess Scrimger.' These pious preliminaries having been duly carried out, Needles, thread, and a number of inchoate garments were distributed by Miss Electa Pratt, who stated confidentially to Mrs. Puffer that she'd had such a shock a person could knock her down with a feather. Other ladies confessed to a trembly feeling, induced, it may be believed, by the dramatic suddenness of Mrs. Salter's communication. That lady, raised to a sudden eminence of social importance, was the object of a brisk fire of questions. But it was soon learned that she knew very little of the actual circumstances. No, she said, I ain't been to the parsonage myself. I had one of my spells last night, and I could scarcely crawl over here to the meeting. But I felt as though it was my duty to come. All I know is, they come home from somewhere yesterday afternoon with a baby. Obed, he telephoned to me about five o'clock that Reverend Pettibone was to the store asking for a nursing bottle. Of course, Obed, he don't keep him in stock, so he told him to go to the drug store. I heard they called in the doctor this morning. It's a very serious thing to adopt a baby, stated Mrs. Buckthorn strongly, and it was felt that she had voiced the sentiment of the meeting. Of course, if you have children of your own, that's one thing, she went on didactically. The Lord sends them, and you've got to do the best you can with what comes. But to take somebody else's child to raise is a terrible responsibility. I don't think Philura Rice had ought to attempt it, more especially as she has assumed other duties and responsibilities as the wife of our pastor. If she'd seen fit to consult me before taking such a step, I should have advised her different. What I want to know is, where did she get it? put in Miss Pratt, and then she giggled in her usual high-pitched girlish manner. <laughs> to, to think of Philura with a baby, <laughs> she cried. The idea! Obed asked Mr. Pettibone where they got it, said Mrs. Salter, and he saw her hummed and awed, and says he, I haven't consulted with Mrs. Pettibone as to whether it will be altogether best to divulge the child's parentage, he says. Did you ever? murmured Mrs. Scrimger. Seems as though we'd got a right to know. I agree with you, said Mrs. Buckthorn sonorously. She folded the red and white gingham legs upon which she had been at work with deliberate motions of her large, fat hands. I'm obliged to leave early today, she told her satellites, 
but i do hope you'll all remain while the light is good because the barrel for the mountain whites really must be got off in time to put in our report for the annual church meeting a resentful silence broken only by the voices of the infant puffers upraised in united protest settled upon the gathering oh, the children observed mrs puffer mildly seem to be getting fretty i think i'd better take em home aren't you going to wait for the tea and cake asked mrs scrimger but mrs puffer had already gathered her belongings and was moving toward the door the baby's fat face bobbing over her shoulder and master georgie trailing a long strip of red and white checked gingham which somebody had tied to an empty spool it's so kind of damp in this room i feel it all through my bones complained mrs salter the doctor told me only yesterday i was to avoid dampness and obed says to me at dinner today when i told him i meant to make an effort and get over to the meeting don't you stay long he says mr salter's awful particular about my health mind what i tell you he says or i'll have you down again on the flat of your back so i guess <laughs> her tall angular figure disappeared through the door to the gentle patter of her speech well it's funny but i can't stay either simpered miss pratt i'd come early a purpose so i could be excused at four i have an important engagement with which miss pratt also departed the ladies who were left cast furtive glances at one another while they set dutiful stitches in the red and white gingham rompers destined for the home missionaries' twins. "'It seems to be clouding up,' sighed one. "'No, but we don't get the light we ought to for sewing,' opined another. "'If you ladies don't object,' said Mrs. Scrimger, who was chairman of the refreshment committee, "'me and Miss Bassett will serve tea kind of early. "'I got to go home to see for something for the deacon.' the entertainment committee withdrew to the adjoining kitchen whence a subdued clatter of cups and plates presently issued a lady distinguished by a deep mourning costume arose i don't care for tea she said gently it upsets my nerves and she went away i don't wonder mrs bartlett can't drink the tea mrs dinkin as scrimger brews murmured a pallid person from the twilight shadow of the sunday school bookshelf it's strong enough to bear up an egg she whispered something to mrs elder trimmer who sat next to her and then glided away with a self-righteous air of superiority i'm sure i don't want any strong tea and social tea crackers are all we'll get for cake said the woman nearest the door and she folded up her red and white gingham legs meaning of course the home missionary legs and silently stole away when mrs scrimger and mrs bassett re-entered the room each bearing a tray with cups and other tea paraphernalia it was to find a room enlivened by neatly folded piles of sanguinary hued material but otherwise empty of occupants well gasped mrs bassett who was short and stout and correspondingly lacking in breath at critical junctures did you ever mrs deaconess scrimger never did in all her life and she said so with great variety and freedom of speech will you have a cup of tea she asked mrs bassett it's hot and strong but mrs bassett appeared never drank tea of an afternoon nor did she at the moment feel appetite for the very dry and pale cakes reposing in serried rows in two church plates of green sprig china mrs bassett thought she must go home at once if mrs scrimger didn't mind and as there were no cups to wash mrs scrimger left to herself drank two cups of tea rather than waste it all after which she providently restored the pale cakes to their pasteboard box they'd do nicely she thought for the next tea and cake meeting it should be acknowledged at once that mrs pettibone had for the first time in years forgotten the meeting of the ladies aid and missionary society the completeness of her lapse of memory being further evidenced by a slip of paper tucked the week before into the frame of her mirror and bearing the words devotional exercises l a m s august twenty second mrs pettibone had actually removed this paper 
inscribed upon it words of far different purport and given it to mr pettibone on the morning of that very day as he stepped forth from the parsonage the baby said mrs pettibone needs these things at once and she appeared so very pink and excited and her hair was rumpled into such careless curls that the minister after glancing at her in his usual professional way looked a second time and then deliberately re-entered the house closed the street door and took her in his arms why silas murmured mrs pettibone in unaffected surprise well you look so sweet he excused himself and kissed her twice this episode having been concluded to the satisfaction of both he again went forth from the ministerial domicile and walked away very fast he felt like whistling a secular tune but refrained it had not been mr pettibone's custom to whistle tunes of any sort on the streets of innisfield then he glanced at the memorandum his wife had given him devotional exercises l a m s august twenty second he read it puzzled him why should the baby require oh but hold on quite as she meant him to do he turned the paper over and perceived other words two cakes the best castile soap white three cards of safety pins small medium and large two yards of fine white flannel and quarter pound of lactose the minister had not slept as well as common the night before there had been various noises of an unfamiliar nature and the ever-recurrent vision of a small figure panoplied in white passing to and fro but the sight of his wife's face across the breakfast table had caused him to forget it all he had not known she could look like that the thought of it followed him as he entered the emporium of elder george trimmer where safety pins of assorted sizes could doubtless be found safety pins said brother trimmer mm, yes we have them he looked inquiringly across the counter at his pastor he had heard of men whose wives were so negligent in the matter of buttons that they were compelled to make use of the invention which he now displayed in nickel-plated profusion upon his counter mr pettibone painstakingly selected three cards small medium and large as per memorandum and fine white flannel he added you have fine white flannel i suppose and um, castile soap oh, the uh, the best he glanced stealthily at the scrap of paper concealed in the palm of his hand oh uh, white the soap must be white well well said mr trimmer with a slightly jocular air hmm, yes mr trimmer was a family man and proud of the fact only two yards of this flannel he inquired only two now i should say you'd require oh, at least eight yes eight wouldn't be any too lavish a pattern i should say some ladies buy ten or even twelve a square yard of this flannel worked around the edge yes worked scalloped as ladies will makes a tip-top infant's blanket i think said mr pettibone rubbing his chin dubiously that it already has a blanket or perhaps two i noticed mrs pettibone <clears throat> yes yes murmured mr trimmer fussily <clears throat> i may say i am surprised <laughs> i'd no idea oh, nor had i till yesterday said his pastor it would never have occurred to me i own but my wife uh, yes you may cut off two yards of that flannel if more is required mrs pettibone will come in later i think the child requires it today as far as i know its wardrobe is somewhat limited mr trimmer's shears which had shiningly snipped their way well into the blue white flannel came to a sudden halt limited he exclaimed honestly aghast and you didn't know until yesterday in the course of our parochial rounds said mr pettibone calmly we chanced yesterday to meet um amid somewhat distressing circumstances a young infant my wife mrs pettibone is a very warm-hearted person 
and being touched by the infant's evident need of maternal care she offered indeed i may say insisted upon you adopted it you took a child to bring up oh, precisely we brought it with us to the parsonage last night it's a boy and appears mr trimmer shook his head i'm sorry you didn't consult me he said before taking such a step why propounded mr pettibone don't you think me capable of bringing up a son mr trimmer smacked his tongue smartly against the roof of his mouth i wouldn't advise anybody to adopt a child he said it's too great a responsibility it would have involved a graver responsibility to leave the child where it was said mr pettibone and why should i not assume a responsibility i am i believe a responsible person mr trimmer looked pityingly at him have you any idea what sort of man that infant will grow into he demanded well no replied the minister can any one predict what their children will grow into can you for example oh yes sir said mr trimmer i can if my boys don't behave i'll make em behave and they know it george trimmer jr will be a man like me and henry is like his ma well correlated the minister tentatively the breed's more than the pasture quoted mr trimmer smartly whose child is it where'd you get him tell me that and i'll tell you impossible said mr pettibone we've decided to keep all that to ourselves but let me remind you brother trimmer that an immortal soul has other attributes than those merely physical all are children of god and inherit eternal life eternal possibilities of glory in adam's fall we sinned all snapped mr trimmer you can't get back of that he finished snipping off the flannel and banged his scissors smartly on the counter as if they had been the shears of fate i hope you won't be sorry ten years from now he added in a tone signifying the exact opposite of his words nor in twenty i ain't got no use for other folks children in that respect said his pastor keenly you differ from jesus of nazareth with which trenchant saying he departed leaving the two yards of blue-white flannel upon the counter mr trimmer gazed at the small parcel with a singular expression on his rather dry and wizened countenance in that respect i differ eh he muttered thoughtfully now what do you mean by that well perhaps i did put it a little bit strong and he forgot his flannel and the safety pins maybe i'd better send em up to the house she might want em for the baby here you george get up to the parsonage with this bundle they're in a hurry for it mr trimmer walked to his desk in the rear of the store and opened his day-book with the intent of entering the items the minister had forgotten to pay for adopted he repeated adopted it will cost em a good bit to bring up a boy mm, so it will well guess i won't charge it he laid down his pen with a pleasant glow about his heart that same afternoon when mrs pettibone had fed the baby she sat gazing at him with loving intentness she supposed she ought to put him down in the little bed she had improvised out of two chairs and a pillow but she excused herself on the ground that she had not yet had a chance to take a good look at the child he had cried a good deal in the night and refused the bottle she had so urgently pressed into the small widely opened mouth in the morning she sent for dr north and he had come at once in response to her summons well miss philura what's the matter with you he began as he hurriedly wriggled out of his raincoat or is it the dominey don't know when i've been in this house before mrs pettibone had always stood very much in awe of the excellent doctor his large presence and loud authoritative voice affected many women that way but all of them trusted him you told me 
advised me to adopt a baby she said trembling visibly and i he's here and i don't know what to feed him or anything dr north stared at mrs pettibone his grizzled eyebrows drawn over his bright eyes in an intimidating frown i told you i advised you he blurted out when did i say anything like that to you i've no recollection oh, a long time ago she reminded him you were just coming out of mrs salter's she'd been having a spell don't you remember oh, bless my soul if i should tax my memory with everything i said coming out of mrs salter's but you say you've actually got a baby on the premises and i didn't even know it i'll have to look into this i will indeed can't have that sort of thing going on and he rubbed his big hands together and laughed his big laugh as he followed the small fluttering person of mrs pettibone into the sitting-room where two chairs and a pillow were placed in close juxtaposition to the stove in which a fire was burning i thought i ought to keep him warm she murmured as the doctor flung up a window with a muttered exclamation yes but not cook him miss philura now let's look into this he pulled the flannel from the small pink face why bless my soul he exploded this child can't be much more than a week old where on earth where's the mother he's ten days this morning said mrs pettibone proudly i'm his mother the doctor stared at her frowningly you his eyes said only too plainly of all persons she clasped her hands appealingly oh don't you think i can she murmured i wanted one so long oh and i love him so i'll do everything you tell me i'll well i guess you'll have to seeing as you've got him by hook or crook a boy eh harder to raise than a girl it's well to begin on a girl well we'll see we'll see and he had seen thoroughly and in detail when he finally left the parsonage after a visit of unparalleled length mrs pettibone felt that she had never appreciated sufficiently the vast and profound knowledge locked up in mrs puffer's matronly breast no wonder mothers had that patronizing air she had formerly resented they had a right to be haughty and superior they had a right too to pity ignorant persons who knew nothing of babies mrs pettibone pensively regarded the baby's bottle in which remained a small portion of properly modified milk she had come a long way since yesterday and learned many things of which she had no previous knowledge and the doctor had said he would come again he would come often and she was not to worry about the charge because an adopted baby was different everybody had to take hold with an adopted baby it was no more than right the doorbell rang it was mrs buckthorn and she had come directly from the forgotten meeting of the ladies aid and a missionary society end of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven The Lady's Aid. My dear Philura, Mrs. Buckthorn began at once, I was never more surprised in all the course of my life. Her large face wore a chastened expression of grief, and she stepped softly as she entered the hall i suppose i may see it she murmured in precisely the same tone she would have used in a house of mourning yes responded mrs pettibone also in hushed accents he's asleep now dear dear sighed mrs buckthorn as she stooped over the unconscious infant my my and she clicked her tongue rapidly against the roof of her mouth as the proper preliminary for a repetition of her initial remark varied only by a change of emphasis my dear philura i was never more surprised in the course of all my life isn't he a dear propounded mrs pettibone boldly 
she added with noticeable pride almost arrogance dr north says he's an unusually fine child he weighs nine pounds and of course he'll gain on proper food mrs buckthorn clicked rapidly as if words were inadequate to express her emotions and then she shook her head you shouldn't have done it philura she said solemnly why not asked mrs pettibone but it was evident that she did not ask for information her question on the contrary expressed unqualified defiance and so indeed mrs buckthorn interpreted its meaning you should have consulted me before taking such a serious step she said you don't know what it is to bring up a baby mrs pettibone fortified by her recent conference with dr north elevated her chin slightly nobody does till they try she said i suppose i can learn just as you did mrs buckthorn transfixed her with an awful look motherhood she stated sonorously prepares a woman for the arduous duties which await her you have had no such preparation philura and therefore what about trained nurses they're not even married and they learn mrs pettibone's tone and indeed her manner was almost flippant she added dr north says i shall get along splendidly he says what are you feeding the baby interrupted mrs buckthorn gazing suspiciously at the child's sleeping face over the top of her spectacles modified milk replied mrs pettibone glibly top milk boiled water and lactose in proper oh my broke in the older matron that will never do i don't believe in these new-fangled but dr north says i have no confidence in doctors when it comes to babies oh, but what should a big rough man know about a tender delicate infant demanded mrs buckthorn excitedly what you want to feed that baby is the doorbell rang it was mrs puffer and she carried an amateurish looking parcel done up in newspaper and tied with a strip of red and white checked gingham i just ran in for a minute to bring these little slips she said breathlessly and to see the baby <laughs> oh isn't he it is a boy oh i thought so the minute i looked at him and what are you feeding him oh yes i think that's good only i add barley water instead of plain water and if his precious little tummy gets upset leave off the milk entirely how can you tell oh by the doorbell rang it was miss electa pratt she came in her befrizzled head very much on one side her angular chin seeking to hide itself coyly amid the ruffles at her throat oh, i feel so funny she giggled i don't know what to say philura with a baby oh dear dear i couldn't have been more surprised if you'd really uh, oh don't you know oh, isn't he tiny how do you dare to touch him i shouldn't i know and what does mr pettibone say he isn't in oh that's too bad i wanted to ask him oh and philura if you haven't got a crib for the baby ma says there's one in our attic you can have just as well as the doorbell rang it was mrs salter carrying a small square box of an ancient and fly-specked appearance well it seems as though our sewing society she murmured i just ran over to bring you a sample of dr pilwick's patent purified baby food an agent left it at the store last winter obed doesn't carry it in stock but he says he can get it for you if it agrees with the baby oh there it is oh, what a care i wonder you dare attempt it as i was saying to obed if the lord had seen fit the doorbell rang mrs bartlett like a shadow of woe in her sombre garments glided in she was a pretty woman with eyes perpetually reddened by weeping everybody in innisfield knew that she had lost four children one after the other 
and the four little mounds in the cemetery never lacked fresh blossoms summer or winter she kissed mrs pettibone silently and then moved toward the two chairs and the pillow on which reposed the sleeping infant oblivious to the storm of excitement his small presence in the parsonage had evoked she gazed at the child long and earnestly he looks she murmured in the ear of her pastor's wife like my little jamie the other women in the room were silent even mrs buckthorn blew her nose loudly and sympathetically mrs pettibone squeezed the bereaved mother's hand she knew now she was telling herself how poor mrs bartlett felt before she had not been able to guess i've brought over a few things murmured the lady in black i'd like you to have them for this dear little baby mrs pettibone murmured her thanks the express man will leave a wicker crib and a perambulator i suppose you haven't had time no i don't care to keep them any longer my babies don't need them and this dear little soul how strong and well he looks the doorbell rang mrs trimmer and mrs bassett arrived together both ladies carried parcels so this is what became of our lady's aid crowed mrs bassett all smiles you ought to have seen mrs deacon scrimger and me with the cups and a pot of boiling tea and the cake and all oh here's the baby you certainly did give us the surprise of our young lives mrs pettibone no wonder you forgot the devotional exercises most anybody would mrs trimmer had already pressed her parcel upon mrs pettibone's acceptance a few binders she murmured just tore off of silk and wool flannel some folks catch stitch em, but i never did their little stomachs are too tender oh isn't he where did he come from you'll tell us i know seven pairs of earnest determined eyes fastened upon mrs pettibone's flushed and conscious face i was just going to ask philura that very same question intoned mrs buckthorn is he an orphan twittered mrs puffer patting the blankets anxiously i s'pose he come from somewhere round here inferred miss pratt astutely i heard you brought him in the buggy well we've decided not to tell a slight murmur of surprise arose from seven protesting mouths don't be hasty philura warned mrs buckthorn a secret about a baby is bound to come out well mr pettibone and i both think that on account of the parents ah oh, they are married stated mrs pettibone doggedly but we don't know we don't even know their name well that is i do know their first names and i've named the baby you've named the baby already cried mrs puffer in obvious disappointment i was just going to suggest and i suppose of course mr pettibone being the adopted father his name said mrs pettibone positively is stephen when just before tea-time the minister returned from a round of parish visiting he found his wife alone with her new treasure in a room abounding in new and unfamiliar objects <laughs> why what's happened he inquired gazing short-sightedly at several elaborate creations of wicker work a number of patent nursing bottles a bath-tub and a profusion of small garments spread out on the chairs and tables oh silas cried his wife everybody is so interested you can't think the doorbell rang it was miss malvina bennett she wore her sewing by the day dress and carried a large roll of fashion books under her arm mm -hmm, murmured miss malvina after she had inspected the baby who was at that moment engaged in absorbing his allotted portion of top milk so that's the way it turned out well well she nodded her head understandingly 
I ain't a going to ask you where it come from, but I could make a pretty good guess if I was to try. We're not going to tell anyone, Malvina. Miss Bennett cackled dryly. I met em a coming away, she said. Oh, land, they was canvas in the subject. Electa Pratt, she's a sharp one. They brought it home in the buggy, she says positive, so it must have come from around here. I didn't let on, but I says to myself, unless them folks has gone, I says, and even then, there's Millie Orne knows all about it. Oh, Millie won't tell, murmured Mrs. Pettibone. It's just on account of... Miss Malvina nodded. Just as well to keep it close, if you can, she agreed. But what's become of her? Don't she want the baby? Oh, she thinks, she believes it died. She went away believing. Miss Bennett gave vent to a snort of disgust. If that ain't like that stuck-up old woman, she'd have drove the girl to her death for drowning if it hadn't been for me. I told her point blank about the encircling good, or not that I knowed much about it myself, but it seemed to take a hold on that poor young critter. It did for a fact. She approached her kind, wrinkled face close to Mrs. Pettibone's. I mailed a letter for her, she whispered. I kind of thought. Yes, said Mrs. Pettibone. He must have received it. Oh, do you mean he took her away? Well, I want to know. Miss Bennett poked the small flannel bundle in Mrs. Pettibone's lap with an experimental forefinger. I'd admire to make some clothes for it, she said. I could do em evenings. It's child's play to sew them little things, and I'd love to, I declare I would. It would be a change from grown-up sewing. Her faded eyes met those of her pastor's wife with an imploring look. You wouldn't mind, Philora? Of course I wouldn't, Mrs. Pettibone returned promptly. I can't sew nearly as beautifully as you do. Her thin arms closed jealously about the tiny form. I'm not going to be selfish with him, she breathed. You can come in and hold him whenever you want to, Melvina. And you can pretend he's part yours. Oh, can I? cried Miss Bennett joyously. Oh, say, I'll be his Auntie Malvina, that's what I'll be. It's kind of suitable, too, when you think of it. Me a making her a dress and mailing a letter to his pa and keeping her out of the pond and like that. <laughs> Don't you think so? End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Miss Philura's Baby. When the Reverend Silas Pettibone had yielded to his wife's determined wish in the matter of the baby, he had been very far indeed from realizing the full significance of his act. He would have been ashamed to put his thoughts into words, would very likely have denied that they existed. But his hospitality had appeared in the light of his imperfect masculine understanding to be not unlike that extended to a homeless little animal. Some people, he knew, strenuously objected to sheltering a forlorn, half-starred kitten, driving it from their doors with harsh cries of scorn and contumely. As for a dog, strayed or stolen, they resolutely turned their backs on his pleading eyes and the voiceless eloquence of his persuasive tale. Silas Pettibone was not that sort of man. Solidarity was not merely a word to him. He felt to his innermost fibre the mysterious oneness of life. So this little, unwelcome, unloved scrap of humanity should find shelter under his roof, permanent or temporary, as the case might be. But it was precisely this latter aspect of their quasi-parenthood which continually harassed his wife. If they should come to take him away, she was always saying, her eyes shadowed with fear. We should certainly have to give him up, was the minister's unbiased opinion. We have, you know, no legal right to the child. 
but she gave him to me argued his wife mr pettibone shook his head i was present he would remind her you walked calmly away with the child in your arms she merely allowed you to take him but she didn't want him that is true but uh, it was this but rooted in unknown conditions which haunted mrs pettibone and would not down the day after she had triumphantly carried her point with mrs hill milly orne appeared at the parsonage she was the bearer of a parcel of baby clothes and an envelope which was found to contain banknotes amounting to a hundred dollars in response to mrs pettibone's eager questions milly said she had left mrs hill the night before the parcel had been delivered at the orne's by the expressman who had been employed to fetch a wagon load of trunks from the old eggleston house to the railway station milly supposed the woman had left innisfield grandfather had seen her driving past in a carriage her blue eyes persistently avoided mrs pettibone's what became of the young man asked the minister's wife a resentful blush sprang into the girl's averted face and mounted swiftly to the roots of her bright hair how should i know she murmured oh the exclamation was involuntary but mrs pettibone instantly regretted that she had allowed it to escape her lips milly orne was looking at her defiantly i hope she said coldly i shall never see any of them again then unexpectedly she was compelled to deal with several large tears which forced themselves into view on her lashes i'm sure you'll think oh i know i'm very foolish stammered milly whisking the tears away with a touch of anger but i wish i hadn't gone there at all mrs pettibone forbore questions but she could not help remembering with an uncomfortable sense of guilt that it was at her suggestion milly had gone to the eggleston farm anyway you've earned the new roof she reminded the girl after an awkward silence during which milly dried her eyes and successfully subdued her emotion oh, and the cow that's surely something to be thankful for the girl smiled forlornly i did what i started out to do she assented staring out of the window and presently she added you will keep the baby oh i certainly shall said mrs pettibone unless it has been pointed out to us that the obvious uncertainty of everything in this our earthly experience magnifies our joys and puts as it were a cutting edge upon our powers of appreciation if one could be absolutely assured argue these wise philosophers that one's friends would never die one's house would never burn down and one's investments never fail life would become of a sudden utterly flat stale and unprofitable it is the keen sparkle of the unexpected the undreamed of even the apprehended which makes the draught in any way palatable Philura Pettibone watched the gradual unfolding of her rose of life with a tremor back of the joy. But it was no less a joy for all that, and after months of peaceful and undisputed possession of the child, she almost forgot the tragic face of his young mother. Almost, but not quite. There was the picture of the Huguenot lovers still hanging on the parlour wall. She had named the baby Stephen after his unknown father in a sudden passion of sentiment, and afterwards she regretted her haste. There were so many splendid names for men, and Stephen did so put one in mind of the first martyr. She preferred not to think of martyrs when she looked at the baby. And he was a baby, as Bishop Brooks used to say to the delighted mothers of his congregation. Not even the latest puffer could show such sparkling blue eyes she was glad his eyes were blue and not big and dark and passionate like his poor mother's and his hair curled really curled you know not merely stood on end under diligent applications of a wet hairbrush he was pink as pink as a healthy baby ought to be and of exactly the right fatness in a word little stephen pettibone as he was actually christened by the minister in church of a sunday morning was a baby any woman might be proud to mother it was wonderful too what an all-round difference the baby in the parsonage made 
female parishioners of a critical even censorious turn of mind who had heretofore merely scarified the minister's sermon now stopped him in the street to ask after the baby the fame of the baby went abroad as it were in all the land hard-fisted old farmers driving loads of produce to town broke into broad smiles at the sight of mrs pettibone wheeling the perambulator people came to call at the parsonage who had never before darkened the door of the ministerial domicile the baby in short was like a cheerful little fire newly kindled on a cold hearth people stretched their hand towards him with smiles tardily realizing how cold and frost-bitten they had been and the baby basking in the universal approbation thrived and grew like a lusty little tree in the sunshine every single day mrs pettibone confided to the minister he is sweeter and lovelier than he was yesterday the minister formed the habit of sauntering about till after the baby had had his bath he found to his surprise that he could write better and more easily than ever before his association with the baby appeared to have opened up entirely new regions of biblical truth it was surprising how many trenchant sayings relating to children there were in the bible mr pettibone had not noticed them before being occupied with such themes as total depravity the state of the unsaved soul after death and kindred subjects suited to the joyless adult idea of christianity love had already done much for the rev silas pettibone but there had remained an unsunned side of his nature of which he himself was only dimly conscious so the moon may be cognizant of the cold sterility of its darkened hemisphere mrs pettibone had loyally believed her husband to be quite perfect as he was but she was not blind to the change in him she spent hours in secret teaching the baby to say a single word then one morning wonderful to relate her pupil prefacing his initial effort at speech with a ravishing smile said papa it was a proud moment for both of them and it was on that very morning that for the first time mr pettibone put into words his own secret misgivings if we'd never had him he observed thoughtfully we shouldn't have known what we were missing i should have known said mrs pettibone with a wise smile she could say it now without painful blushes he looked at her intently observing with secret wonder the changes wrought by her quasi-motherhood she had certainly grown plumper her eyes and cheeks and lips had taken on a look of youth the lines of her arms and shoulders had changed subtly as arms and shoulders will under a burden daily growing heavier yet always more beloved but if they should come now to take him he went on i'm afraid mrs pettibone was putting on the baby's cloak preparatory to taking him out for an airing she successfully extracted one pink fist from the sleeve she had first made into a nest and then proceeded to rumple up the other in a way mrs puffer had taught her why do you say that she asked reproachfully just as i was beginning to forget about it she kissed the baby passionately in the nape of his neck where fuzzy yellow curls were beginning to take advantage of his improved habits in the way of sitting up do you know he's nine months old silas he'll soon be a year and we haven't heard a word from any of them oh never mind precious he didn't like to have his bonnet tied oh, indeed he didn't now he's going day day there she achieved a smart bow under the protesting chin take him a minute dear while i put on my hat and wheel the carriage out he's sleepy he'll be sound the minute i take him out she was tucking the baby snugly in his perambulator for although it was april and the big maples were already brave with scarlet blossoms the wind still flourished a keen edge which put one in mind of blue-white snows and unmelted ice to the northward mrs wessels her head draped in a plaid tea-towel stood looking on that worthy woman was armed with a broom and dustpan and her face was drawn into myriad puckers and folds of deliberate thought my my she exclaimed who would have thought one short year ago i'd be standing here on the parsonage stoop watching mrs pettibone all took up with a baby as i was saying to wessels only yesterday she couldn't be no more took up i says if it was her own child 
and wessels he says it's wonderful how he thinks things out settin there by the stove she mightn't be so took up half as much he says positive if it was her baby and i guess that's so come to think of it you'd feel easier and more different like in your mind if i don't see why you should think so interrupted mrs pettibone grasping the handle of the perambulator firmly she appeared slightly defiant as if mrs wessels had unwittingly touched upon a subject already uppermost in her mind the baby is mine she added positively just as much mine as if but you ain't adopted it legal have you inquired mrs wessels more for the sake of sustaining her pose of easeful contemplation than for any information she hoped to elicit when you sweep the parlour to-day mrs wessels i'd like you to wipe off the windows said mrs pettibone pointedly ignoring the question she added that the windows in question were very dusty yes i know they be agreed mrs wessels with a mournful sigh i noticed they looked something terrible when i come along this morning and i says to myself louisa wessels i says if you've the time and strength to-day you must get round to wash off them windows for mrs pettibone they're a disgrace to the parsonage i says all streaked and gormed up but i dunno i got an awful gone feeling to the pit of my stomach to-day i says to wessels this morning if twas anybody but mrs pettibone i was going to work for i believe i'd stayed home and took care of myself but i know you wasn't one to take advantage of nobody so i come and i'll do my best if i can get round to them windows i will if i can't uh, just you take a little kerosene on a rag and do em yourself twon't take you no time but i wouldn't leave em that way another week if i was you looks real slack uh, where do you say i'd find the tea oh guess i'll make me a cup before i do another lick o work if you don't want i should drop right down in my tracks <laughs> and when i think o wessels and all them children hanging on to miss skirts and me doing a day's work for the victuals they put in their mouths it does seem like i ought to take care of myself now don't it mrs pettibone had moved slowly toward the gate during this exordium pushing the perambulator before her she was embarked upon the smooth expanse of sidewalk beyond when she again heard the pursuing voice of mrs wessels and glancing back beheld that lady leaning reposefully upon the fence the chequered towel about her head fluttering gaily in the wind oh and say mrs pettibone she called out you going to the meat market i thought maybe you was i didn't see nothing but scraps of bacon in the ice chest i just wanted to tell you if you was planning for my dinner let it be pork chops ain't nothing more tasty nor strengthening oh uh, what ma'am you don't think so and you say minister don't like em to work on why land <laughs> there ain't any victuals i know of it stands by you like fresh pork and if it ain't too much trouble uh, seeing as you got the baby carriage and can bring it just as well as not uh, can you fetch me ten cents worth of cat meat uh, yes ma'am cat meat's what i said it makes lovely soup you didn't know that <laughs> being the minister's wife you'll likely get a good bag full you don't need to let on it's for me tell kelly your cat eats real hearty he does for i've seen him at the baby's milk yesterday oh you didn't know well i tipped it over getting some for me tea and the cat licked it up oh yes ma'am save me the trouble of getting down on my hands and knees a cat's useful that way i'm going in now if the doorbell rings do you want i should call the minister if it's a peddler i won't no mum but as i tell wessels mrs pettibone had already passed out of hearing trundling the carriage with its hud snugly drawn against the assaults of the wind she stopped at the post office and the postmaster handed her two religious papers an advertisement of a church organ and a letter directed in a firm masculine hand to mr pettibone she tucked the mail under the baby's blanket for safekeeping and proceeded on her way miss electa pratt arrayed bleakly in a new spring suit of black and white check and a hat bristling with ribbon bows and impossible flowers was just issuing from the portals of the trimmer emporium good morning flora she said and how is the baby dear me i can't get used to seeing you out with it 
I should think you'd feel kind of queer. Queer? echoed Mrs. Pettibone. She took advantage of the pause in her progress to peep under the hood. The baby was sleeping soundly, his long, dark lashes resting lightly on the warm rose of his cheek. Miss Pratt peeped, too. Isn't he an awful care? she asked. I notice you don't get time for ladies' aid any more, and you're hardly ever at church. Once in a while, Milly Orne takes care of him for me, Mrs. Pettibone said. I wouldn't trust him with anyone else. Miss Pratt's greenish eyes glittered unpleasantly. Well, I found out where you got him, she said. You might as well have told in the first place. You found out, echoed Mrs. Pettibone and instinctively she braced herself for what might be coming. Miss Pratt giggled. Oh, "'Tain't so hard to see through a millstone with a hole in it, once you take notice of the hole,' she remarked acidly. "'He's the child of that young woman who was up to the Eggleston farm last summer. She ran away and left it, and the other woman gave it to you.' There was feline enjoyment in the eyes she fixed upon Philora Pettibone's agitated face. Oh, that don't surprise you none, of course, but maybe this will. Their name wasn't Hill at all, but Cruden. The day Al Fisher took the trunks down from the farm, I happened to be at the station inquiring for a package, so I took a good look at them. They was all marked C, and one of them had a card tacked on to it as had been scratched off with a pencil. As luck would have it, I had an eraser in my bag, so I rubbed it off and copied what I could see. It was... Electa! exclaimed Mrs. Pettibone weakly. Oh, you don't think it was real nice for me to find out something about your baby? Well, I thought it was my Christian duty. You want I should tell you what I seen on that card? Mrs. Pettibone drew a tremulous breath. I, I don't know, she murmured. I... I guess you do, said Miss Pratt. Anyway, I was coming to tell the minister this morning. I just got the letter. The flowers in the new spring hat rustled like dried cat's tails in the cold wind. I don't believe I... Oh, please don't, Electa. I'd listen if I was you, advised Miss Pratt strongly. You'll have to know, first or last. The name on that card was Mrs. Alexander Cruden, Chilworth Gardens, Chicago. They came far enough away from home, anybody'd suppose. But as it happens, uh, Ma has a cousin living out in Chicago, so I wrote to her and asked a few questions. She didn't answer for a long while, and I'd about give up. But yesterday... Though the baby, said Mrs. Pettibone in a small, weak voice, he's waking up. I, I must be going home. I'll walk along with you, Philora, volunteered Miss Pratt amiably. I'd like to show Mr. Pettibone the letter I got from my cousin, Matilda Slicer. She's an own cousin of Ma's on the Smith side. You don't want I should? Well, I must say you're grateful. But you can't prevent me from telling Mr. Pettibone, even if you did manage to marry him with your wonderful new thought. Oh, I know how you worked it, Philora, and there's others... But Philura Pettibone had fled hastily down a side street, and Miss Pratt forbore to follow. She was anxious to stop at her friend Mrs. Buckthorn's, who would, she was confident, appreciate to the full the news of which she was at present sole proprietor and purveyor. Mr. Pettibone, as was his invariable custom, permitted his morning mail to lie unopened on the hall table this method of procedure tending to a more complete concentration of mind on topics of an otherworldly nature. There was not infrequently food for disturbing thought in the party-coloured envelopes bearing tradesmen's names in the upper left-hand corner. It was true that his church, after strenuous and concerted effort, had at the time of his marriage paid all arrears of his salary in full. But since that date, the brethren had lapsed into an easeful complacence in view of the well-known frugality of the second Mrs. Pettibone. Everybody in Innisfield knew that Philura Rice had been as poor as the proverbial church mouse. Ergo, she was well accustomed to strenuous economy. 
and it would be a pity indeed to encourage this sinful extravagance which would undoubtedly obtain in the ministerial domicile under the urge of temptation in the subtle guise of a promptly paid salary the minister's digestion being slightly impaired the letters were frequently allowed a still longer period of neglect while he played with the baby the baby newly awakened from his nap was in capital form for a frolic and mr pettibone had acquired the useful and pleasant habit of devoting himself to the small bright-eyed tyrant while his wife washed the dinner dishes mrs pettibone had not yet spoken to her husband of elector pratt's officious detective work he would be indignant she was sure and after all elector had discovered nothing of any real importance she recollected as she polished the glasses that the young woman had said her name was sylvia cruden on the occasion of their first meeting in the eggleston woods of course elector's discoveries would soon become common property with such ingenious addenda as miss slicer the western cousin chose to write and elector to invent it was all very disagreeable but it could not affect her secure possession of the baby she could hear his chuckles of infantile glee and the forensic voice of mr pettibone as he recited mother goose rhymes for the baby's delectation she smiled happily to herself elector pratt might talk all she liked so might mrs buckthorn so might the parish at large she hoped they would enjoy it mrs wessels had finished the sweeping in her own peculiar way a way philura pettibone would not have put up with a few short months ago but when one had a baby to care for other things must stand aside mrs wessels had not it was plain sufficient strength to wash the windows in the parlour it was early only half past one indeed when mrs pettibone set the last clean dish upon the shelf she decided that she would wash the windows herself the baby would be good he was always good she would arrange his toys on a thick comfort on the parlour floor and circumscribe his activities with the indispensable yard she would then be free to remove the indubitable traces of small moist fingers from the window panes mrs wessels had referred to them as a disgrace to the parsonage and mrs pettibone reflected that she would have unqualifiedly agreed with mrs wessels at an earlier stage of her career she recalled her unspoken but no less harsh criticisms of mrs puffer's window glass now she thought she rather liked it it looked as if there were children in the house she said it plainly in the privacy of her own thoughts and the words brought a delicate kindling of hope to her cheeks and eyes she was still looking very pink and pretty when she authoritatively interrupted the frolic in the study the baby she explained must have his dinner at once and she hoped mr pettibone had not forgotten the meeting of the c e convention committee in the prayer meeting room at three in reply to a half-hearted inquiry she stated that in her opinion his second best preaching suit would be plenty good enough for the occasion it was at this moment that mr pettibone's divided attention became centred upon his mail which mrs pettibone kindly deposited upon his writing-table then she held out her arms for the baby there was a moment of delicious triumph for the minister when the small despot turned from the cajoling smile of the lady to hide his curly head against his breast he likes me cried mr pettibone with fervid conviction tempered only by an amazed incredulity of course he does chimed in mrs pettibone as she captured the baby and bore him away in triumph he loves his daddy bless him he heard her cooing on the other side of the door the religious newspapers received a passing glance promising an hour of future enjoyment the alluring advertisement of church organs a renunciatory sigh as it found lodgment in an overcrowded waste-basket but upon the letter addressed to himself in an unknown hand and postmarked with the name of a distant city he spent a motionless abstracted half-hour end of chapter twenty eight
Chapter Twenty Nine of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine. The Lord gave. It lacked a quarter of three by the gloomy black marble clock presented by an admiring parish on the occasion of his first marriage, when Mister Pettibone, his hair very much rumpled and a worried, almost distracted expression on his kind grave face stepped across to the parlour my dear philura he began and then stopped to rumple his hair afresh with a distraught gesture why silas she cried turning from a comprehensive polishing of the lower left-hand pane of the front window which being of a cheap greenish glass but ill rewarded her labours you're not even dressed and that meeting she paused to remove the handle of the baby's rattle-box from a too close proximity to his windpipe. "'That's the third time,' she announced. "'He seems possessed to ram that celluloid thing down his blessed little throat.' She surveyed the article in question with severely critical eyes. "'I should think anybody would know better than to make a toy like that for a baby,' she said. "'I shan't give it to him any more, Silas.' even if mrs buckthorn did give it to him she says all her children cut their teeth on it but i don't care if they did that doesn't make it any better mr pettibone glanced distractedly about the room i uh, um oh don't you think my dear you'd better leave the windows in this room till another day he inquired rather wildly oh it seems to me silas you'll certainly be late at that committee meeting declared mrs pettibone looking up from a rapturous cuddle of the baby isn't he the sweetest thing she added irrelevantly oh lord lord groaned mr pettibone he dropped into a chair as if spent with emotion what's the matter silas demanded mrs pettibone tardily aware of his perturbation and she gazed searchingly at him is it your stomach i knew i ought not to have those pork chops for dinner tell me silas i can't muttered the minister i might have known it's my fault if i'd only she was standing in the middle of the floor the baby pressed against her breast i know she said quietly you've heard something her steadfast eyes wavered for an instant as her lips sought the crown of the curly little head tell me she begged he drew a deep breath they uh, <clears throat> they just found out he began avoiding her eyes the letter was from yes she breathed and they're coming today he said you must they may be here at any moment oh, they shan't have him silas she cried in a breaking voice i can't give him up i can't i love him so my dear he said gravely my dear their eyes met in a long look she held out the child to him with a renunciatory gesture oh, take him please i must put this room to rights before it was all over before the black marble clock on the mantel told the hour of four like other dreaded crises in life it arrived quietly enough this time in the shabby guise of a depot hack drawn up before the parsonage gate mrs pettibone stood in the window the child in her arms and watched the two young figures emerge from its stuffy interior and hurry up the walk the girl had been crying she noticed she was dressed somberly in black the man at her side bent his tall head as if to encourage her with murmured words and they paused for an instant in the sparse shadow of a budding lilac the girl looked up at him a lovely smile breaking over her face then the bell jangled noisily as had been agreed on beforehand mr pettibone opened the door she heard a brief question a briefer answer and then the parlour door closed quietly <laughs>
it seemed a long time that she stood there gazing out of the window the child held close against her breast the baby whimpered a little and twisted his rosy face towards her he wants to go out in his carriage she thought with an uncontrollable throb of pain and then at last the door opened and the minister very pale and grave stood gazing at her compassionately from the threshold after a moment of indecision he came in closing the door behind him the young woman's mother is dead he uttered the words tentatively almost humbly and she offered no comment it seems mrs maitland knew nothing of the child's existence he went on hurriedly until her mother sent for her the day before her death up to that time mrs cruden had refused to communicate with her daughter i should explain perhaps that hill was a family name assumed merely for convenience the child's impatient whimper changed to a fretful cry he wants me to take him out she said in a clear colourless voice he's used to going out at this time mr pettibone took two steps towards her his face twitching strangely oh my dear he murmured you will be brave you won't he stopped abruptly and turned again toward the door their name he said slowly is maitland you will come now and speak to them she walked steadily across the hall hushing the child in her arms mechanically he shall go out pretty soon she was murmuring so he shall mother will put his coat on and his little bonnet the young woman was standing by the window her handkerchief crumpled into a moist little ball clutched in one hand she turned swiftly her eyes fastening upon the child in mrs pettibone's arms is that my baby she asked she didn't look at mrs pettibone my wife said the young man rather stiffly has been very much upset by the suddenness of her mother's death perhaps you will understand i understand said mrs pettibone the baby had turned from the stranger in the large black hat and was hiding his face in her neck with little whimpering cries he's afraid mrs pettibone explained he doesn't like black oh but he mustn't be afraid of me he's my baby oh, come to mother darling oh stephen isn't he a dear and he looks like you his eyes the baby's name said mrs pettibone steadily is stephen how nice of you oh but i could have changed it you know if you'd called him anything else of course he had to be named after his father her large dark eyes sought her husband's inquiringly he'd taken his watch from his pocket we haven't much time he told her mrs maitland glanced doubtfully at the minister's wife i'll get his things ready mrs pettibone offered quietly you'll want everything of course the young mother shook her head i don't think we've got time she objected we can buy everything you know and we must get the express from boston tonight oh do let me take him he'll have to get used to his mother the darling i'm afraid i don't know much about babies but we'll hire a nurse for him right away the child's desolate little cry pursued her as she hurried from the room she could hear too the futile attempts of the young parents to quiet him his pitiful complainings rang in her ears while she hastily rolled some little garments into an awkward bundle they could buy everything and they'd hire a nurse for him at the supreme moment of parting young mrs maitland appeared to be visited by a transient gleam of comprehension i suppose you'll really miss him she said brightly and i haven't even thanked you dear mrs pettibone what must you think of me but i do appreciate everything more than i can say if mother had only told me about baby poor mother she meant to be kind you will let us pay you for taking care of him all these months he must have cost a lot and we are rich you know now that poor mother but at this mrs pettibone who had preserved her usual tranquil 
even smiling demeanour to the uneasy wonderment of her husband drew back pay me she breathed pay me for taking care of my baby the minister listened to her movements in the room over his study for quite half an hour after the depot hack had rolled away it was very quiet in the house save for those hushed footfalls on the floor above she had chosen it for the baby's nursery because of the morning sun which streamed in through its three windows mr pettibone sat very still huddled together in his study chair a desolate sense of bereavement deepening within him many times he had stood calmly above a little casket voicing those words of the universal heartbreak the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord he tried to repeat them now but the words died upon his lips the sounds in the room above had ceased and the silence beat heavily upon his ears he compelled himself to get to his feet to ascend the stair the lord gave and the lord hath taken away he must somehow manage to convey comfort to that sorely stricken heart she sat quite still in the gathering dusk over against the window looking toward the east there were small finger marks upon the pane he remembered that only that morning she had sat there the baby on her knee looking out at him as he raked the sodden leaves and the child had beat upon the glass with its rosy palms he crossed the room on tiptoe and knelt down at her side and putting his arms about her pressed his wet cheek to hers why silas she said stirring a little oh, why my dear she had not been weeping then he experienced a vague sense of bewilderment not unmixed with fear then all at once he perceived that she was smiling her face dimly luminous in the dusk of the april evening i was thinking she said slowly about him yes dear he murmured his spent breath sounding very like a sob from the very first day you remember silas and ever since her empty hands suddenly tightened in her lap i hope she said that his nurse will love him she said she would hire a nurse rich women do that she said they were rich silas you heard her my dear philura he reminded her with a touch of his old authority she is his mother we must not forget that i know she submitted he rose to his feet presently and looked about him at the white crib in the corner with its tiny pillow still bearing the imprint of the baby's head at the cheap little toys neatly arranged in a basket at the small toilet appurtenances set forth upon the bureau we must give these things away he said almost harshly put them out of sight i cannot allow you but she lifted her hand with a pleading gesture no silas no she said softly let them stay end of chapter 29 Chapter Thirty of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty, Milly. Daffodils and crocus spread vivid patches of colour against the stiff brown mould of the Orne garden, and languid bees, plunged deep in their faintly odorous cups, smeared their brown bodies in the plentiful pollen with soft humming of content over against the leafless hedge sprays of yellow bush and flowering almond were beginning to show a delicate tracery of gold and rose grandma orne standing in the door her gingham apron over her head looked forth over the garden to the orchard beyond it does be all she murmured how everything comes round just the same year after year things that don't make no difference like yellow bush and crocus blows they don't look no older than i was young 
and me and grandpa are standing here both of us straight and strong and full of gumption a body would think a bush was more account than folks if they didn't know no better what you mutterin' about grandma propounded a feeble voice from the bedroom seems as though your tongue is always a waggin mrs orne poured the contents of a saucepan into a cup her lips firmly compressed you've been asleep grandpa nigh on a two hours she told him here's your broth all nice and hot and i'll put an extra pilly under your head so as you can drink it the old man groaned protestingly as he yielded to her ministrations i ain't been asleep he contradicted not for a minute don't you suppose i know i heard you were snoring said grandma convincingly you certainly had a real nice nap she held the steaming cup to his puckered lips i want you should swallow this right down she exhorted him anxiously so's to get up your strength the spring's coming on real nice why there's crocus and yellow bush and butter and eggs all in blow just where you planted em out when we was first married you remember don't you grandpa he stared at her uncomprehendingly over the brim of the cup his eyes under their sparse lashes resembling dull blue glass where's milly he demanded fretfully i ain't seen her all day she don't seem to care if her old grandpa now don't you talk that way interrupted mrs orne with a brisk show of authority milly come in to see you first thing this morning and she was up in the night a couple of times too to fix the fire i guess you forgot she bent over the bed and spoke loudly in the old man's ear milly's a workin to malvina bennett's shop she's a learnin the dressmaking trade grandpa well you don't have to holler at me like that he rebuked her i ain't no deeper than you be what milly want to do that for i'd like to know i want her at home she could make out to plant the lettuces and radishes i guess and you you want to get them tomatoes started in them tin cans i saved seems like i put a ripe tomato on a board to dry for seed well i, I don't know well, well, i don't know his wrinkled lids fell suddenly over the dull blue of his tired old eyes he was asleep mrs orne softly withdrew the extra pillow from beneath her husband's head then she stood looking down at him her head slightly tremulous with age bent to one side her hands touching the bedclothes with little caressing pats well i guess grandpa is better she murmured he looked real bright when he was setting up and he contradicted me just as pert and sassy oh he'll be round grandpa will oh land i must get them tomato seeds started i clean forgot em milly came home early that night she was afraid grandpa wasn't quite so well when she'd left him in the morning she explained the old lady reassured her with little cackling reminiscences of grandpa's smart sayings during the day and you ought to have heard him a finding fault she finished triumphantly oh he's a picking up grandpa is twon't be no time before he's out a puttering round the garden but i'm afraid you'll be hopping mad when he finds we clean forgot tomatoes <laughs> they ought to be an inch high be now <laughs> he wants you should plant the radishes milly and i guess you'd better do it right off so's i can tell him tomorrow maybe it'll kind of pacify him the sun was sinking in a soft glow of burning rose as the girl thrust her spade deep in the yielding loam she had changed her neat gown to one of faded gingham and over it wore an old coat of grandfather's a concession to grandmother's anxious fears unless she should take cold on her feet were broken shoes plenty good enough for the garden the old lady had declared providently milly had yielded without protest but once out of sight of the window where grandmother was washing the tea things she flung aside the hat pressed down over her bright hair the walls of miss malvina's sewing-room had seemed to stifle the girl that day she welcomed the cool wind which had sprung up at sunset with a sigh of relief 
high up in the big chestnut trees across the road robins were singing and from the reedy margin of the brook uprose the plaintive piping of frogs afar off on a neighbouring farm a cow blatantly announced her annual bereavement the hollow melancholy note floated lonesomely on the wind seemed indeed to be a part of it as it swept the budding trees on its way down the valley the light was fading as she scattered the seed in the shallow drills she had prepared for it the cow had ceased her complaining by now but the plaintive frogs piped louder than ever from their reedy marsh Minnie was thinking vaguely of the gentle patter of Miss Malvina's conversation that day. The little dressmaker had indulged in various reminiscences of her own youth, as the two women set neat finishing stitches on a gown intended for a village bride. "'Real pretty, ain't it?' said Miss Malvina, surveying her handiwork with honest pride. "'Land, I remember when I first begun sewing steady, I used to feel kind of nervous like whenever I had to make a wedding dress or a shroud. Seems as though the goods felt kind of different to the hand. I suppose I hadn't really given up being married myself, and I had a kind of notion in them days that I'd die young if I wasn't. It seemed like an awful while to forty even. Or thinks I, I can't never stand it that long. But land i guess there's some folks just born to help other folks live and die i know i was for here i be fifty-one my last birthday and still chipper and making up wedding dresses and shrouds or anything that comes to hand and i've give up dying definite till my time comes milly smoothed the earth carefully above the radish seed and pressed it down with a board as grandfather had taught her wondering if, after all, it would seem so terribly long to thirty, and if, arrived at that distant bourne, she could at last forget youth and the poignant ache of loneliness at her heart. She arose from her knees presently and brushed the loose earth from her gown. Grandmother had lighted the lamp and set it on a table near the window. Its long ray of pale light extended into the gathering dusk, like an unyielding finger pointing down a grey vista of years to be travelled humbly and meekly. Then all at once she perceived that she was not alone. Absorbed in her thoughts, she had not heard the click of the gate, nor his step on the soft earth. He stood a little way off, gazing at her doubtfully. "'I wasn't sure at first that it was really you,' he said. She glanced awkwardly at her faded gingham and ragged coat, her heart beating suffocatingly in her throat. Already she had seen that he was older, graver, and that his dress was of a sober elegance. "'Aren't you going to speak to me, Milly?' His voice seemed to come to her from a great way off. "'Oh, well, you, you surprise me,' she stammered. Her hands, she was thinking, were stained with earth. Her feet in their broken shoes moved a little. And then all at once she felt his arms close about her, Milly, Milly, he was murmuring, his lips against her cold cheek. She struggled to free herself. No, no, she cried out. You must let me go. Why, don't you love me? Have you forgotten already? He drew away from her, his face pale in the fading light. But perhaps you're thinking. I finished thinking long ago, she said her delicate head thrown back, her eyes gazing straight into his. All these months, when I heard nothing from you. Oh, you don't know, he interrupted eagerly. My mother, you will let me explain. It isn't necessary, she said sadly. You're not in my world, Walter Hill. You had nothing else to do, nothing even to amuse yourself with, so you amused yourself with me. Your mother permitted it because she needed a servant. That's what I'm fit for, a servant. I understand, I know. You needn't explain. Milly, he said gravely, my mother is dead. His voice broke a little over the hard word. All that she did, strange, even cruel as it may seem to you, must be forgiven now. Do you think you can forgive her and me? She gazed at him without speech, her eyes under the fallen masses of her hair, wet with sudden tears. Oh, but I'm... Oh, you don't know everything, she murmured. I'm not even... You are the woman I love, 
he made swift answer and in his voice and eyes was all the boy's passion deepened and made sacred by the sorrowful realization of the man who has looked upon death and from it learned something of the meaning of life end of chapter thirty end of the heart of philura by florence morse kingsley